Welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. This is May the 19th, 2019. And uh, today we have Jason Kapalka from the Mysterious Package Company. Hey, Jason. Hello. How's it going? Oh, not too bad. Um, let's do our personal introductions like normal real fast, and then we can talk with Jason. Uh, I'm Mike Davis, Lovecraft Easing, and let's start with Rick. Uh, I'm Rick Lay, writer and uh, nominee for the uh, Cranian Award from the Robert E. Howard Foundation. Yeah, when do you find out about that? Uh, June 6th, I believe. Yeah, well, congratulations. Good luck, yeah. Yeah. That's very cool. Matt. Hi, I'm Matt Carpenter. I uh, run Movie Night right now, and if you are interested... The poll for next week's movie is up on the e message board. Although, if you really don't plan to show up, uh, let the people who are going to be there vote. Yeah. Have you been getting some of that? Most of it. Oh, okay. Uh, Kirk. Uh, my name's Kirk Battle. I'm an uh, author whenever I can get a free second. And um, I've got a podcast going on right now, Cthulhu in the Deep South. It's historical fiction set in antebellum slavery and also during the civil war and um we're working hard on season three right now uh tune in you can find it on podcast or youtube and uh hey pete nice nice of you to make it <laughs> want to introduce yourself <laughs> sure i am pete Rollick. i am battered bruised and just a little bit lit what's the matter with you uh, i went fishing today oh okay all right, so um, Jason, would it be uh, again, guys? Feel free to jump in with questions uh, if you have any. But Jason, would it be accurate to say that you're basically the owner of the company, or do other people have shares as well, and you have the majority, or how does that work? Um, it would be accurate to say I'm the owner. Uh, yeah, we do have some sort of programs for uh, people to have. Uh, you know, sort of shares and so forth. But uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, effectively, I'm the majority owner right now. Okay. Uh, yeah, I got involved with it. Well, I, I'll, I'll let you go on, but. Um, oh, no, you're fine. Uh, it's uh, such a great idea. Um, it's uh, very interesting. I first became aware of it several years ago. I don't remember how. And um, then lately, you've had Neil Patrick Harris doing ads for you. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that was uh, interesting. He was, well, I, I yeah, I don't want to jump ahead of, of myself here, but. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, yeah, well, he was, a, he was a fan. He's been a fan of the company for a couple years, and he's ordered a lot of weird things from us. As it turns out, he's, he's a fan of a lot of weird stuff. So he's got, apparently he's got a, a house in LA full of all sorts of weird paraphernalia. And the story behind the ad that he did for us was that he had a, he, he had this old, a Zoltan machine, one of those fo fortune telling devices that you see in uh, big, yeah, uh, like an original one, and he's having it restored in his house, and then kind of he was like modifying it to make it slightly more sinister, like with like weird backwards music and things like that. But he wanted to get custom fortune cards for it; they were a little bit off kilter, and so he he approached us and asked if we could, you know, he thought that we'd be good at doing some sort of just slightly weird, slightly ominous kind of fortune cards for this restored Zoltan machine. So he said, yeah, that sounds like an interesting project. So, uh, yeah, we made up a bunch of these, you know, just slightly demented, you know, fortune cards for this machine that exists nowhere but in in Neil Patrick Harris's, you know, apartment or house in L.A. And, you know, distressed them and made them look kind of weird and stained and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so then they sent them, sent those off to him. And, uh, yeah, I guess he was happy with that. And. You know, he was willing to do some tweets or whatever, but we we just started asking, was like, you know, you know, that would be great, but what would be really cool is if you, you know, could do like some sort of selfie video of yourself, you know, ranting into the camera about some sort of, you know, conspiracy, you know, that was uh, from this mysterious package company, and then we'd edit it into some sort of an ad. And yeah, he just went off, and you know, a month later, we got this weird video from him of him ranting into the <laughs> camera. And, uh, yeah, I yeah. love that 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 uh, that ad. That, that was pretty funny. Yeah, no, it was, it was pretty cool. I mean, obviously, I don't know if we would have been able to hire him on a more traditional basis. I assume his rates are, you know, probably pretty pretty uh, stiff for a standard commercial. So I was just fortunate. Probably. That he <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, so you've got you've got 
quite a few different experiences. Let's start with, um, you've got a, a, the Creative Cthulhu uh, experience. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah, maybe I, should, I, I probably should back up and maybe explain what, what the Mysterious Package Company actually is. Uh, yeah, yeah, actually, you and I talked about that, didn't we? Yeah. yeah because it's, it, it's awesome a really cool thing, thing to see. There, uh, it's the most awesome thing that I've ever been gifted. Well, there we go. <laughs> that's the uh, that's 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 what it is. Um, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, you know, just yeah. It was kind of. I mean, and and there's there's. I guess there's. You know, there's sort of more elaborate ways to put it, but um, but yeah. I mean, the the idea was to make the mail an exciting thing again, something that would ideally be the the most freaky, surprising, awesome gift you might get in the mail. You know, the kind of thing you get for someone you know, that you, that, you know, you, you know, will appreciate something truly bizarre and unusual and has, you know, enough of a sense of humor and whatever else that they'll kind of accept something kind of alarming that comes to the mail. Um, so yeah, in effect, what that means is that you go to mysteriouspackage.com and uh, you can order one of these, what we call experiences, which will then be sent to either you or someone you designate. And that person will start to receive a variety of things in the mail, usually starting with, you know, a letter that appears to be coming from something like a, a law firm, you know, uh, telling you about a previously unheard of aunt or uncle who has uh, bequeathed you something in their will. And, you know, it'll appear re pretty genuine. You know, the, the, web, uh, the, the law firm will have a website and a phone number you know, that they'll never actually pick up on. Uh, and then that's followed by other things that come in the mail, typically stuff like uh, journals or diaries and you know, newspaper clippings or little trinkets like amulets or rings and other little hanks of hair, various odd things like that. Uh, and then these culminate in the delivery of a, a nailed shut wooden crate, which has, you know, you have to pry open with a crowbar or something. And inside of that will be the conclusion of this experience, usually some sort of large object like a statue or a voodoo doll or a zombie claw or a ray gun from the future or something like that. Um, and then, you know, the conclusion of the storyline. And then after that, you'll get a reveal telling who it was that sent you this thing. Yeah, Cause like you and I discussed a little bit during our video test, it's, it's one of those really cool things. Like when I first saw it, I thought this is coolest thing ever, but I don't quite understand what it is. And you said you hear that a lot. It's a little bit of a weird thing because it's partially the fact that we're still struggling with how secret to be about it in that we we're trying not to give away all the secrets so that people who are receiving them can't instantly Google it and find out everything. Right. Um, but at the same time, you know, of course, you're, you're, you need to show people something to get them to spend you know, a fair amount of money buying a weird product you know so if you can say two hundred dollars for something to send in the mail people you know unsurprisingly want to know a little bit about what it actually is so we kind of have always been struggling with this sort of battle between secrecy and the need to kind of basically market stuff and let people know about it you know i talked to tisa a little bit about this when from your company when she first contacted me and i compared it to a movie that's about to come out say avengers endgame you haven't you haven't seen it yet, uh, for example. Um, you know that you can get on the internet and get all the spoilers before you go to the movie, mm -hmm. but you don't do that because you don't you don't want to spoil the experience. You make that decision. I, I I would agree, and I think that's true. And for some of you know, there's some of our products that we have that are, you know, you kind of know what it is, and you know, it's not really anything you'll spoil necessarily by accident. Uh, but one of the problems is that in, in some cases, the ideal way to experience a mysterious package is without knowing where it came from. So a lot of people will receive them and, you know, they don't really know where it came from, who sent it. You know, they, there's just that the ideal thing for us if they think there's even a chance, and even if it's a 5% chance that this, you know, a series of weird diaries and clippings are getting from this, you know, supposed aunt or uncle, there's maybe a 5% chance it's real somehow. And... So the problem in that case is those people, they don't quite know what it is. And so naturally they're going on the internet, you know, to do research into, you know, all this material. And unfortunately then it can be a bit of a spoiler because they find out, oh, it's not actually, you know, uh, uh, the curse of a weird jaguar from Peru. It's actually, oh, it's a thing. Some guy bought me a thing. So that's 
Yeah, I mean, it's 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 kind of you know it's hard to completely avoid in in the internet era, but it's still, it still it it causes some disappointment for some people when they spoil that surprise a little early. And again, it's they don't know that they're going to spoil it. They're just saying it's like, oh, I've got a weird thing in the mail. Boy, I want to find out what's going on with this archaeological expedition. And then they they search and they see, it, you know. And if you're not careful, you might come across a link that would spoil it. Right. So it's yeah, it's we tried all sorts of weird things over the years to try to avoid those. Uh, we changed the names and some of the products occasionally, so they're not as easily found. Um, we put disinformation out there, sort of fake web pages and other stuff to kind of confuse the issue if someone Google's it. Um, but it's uh, yeah, it's an it's an ongoing challenge. So we haven't 100% figured out how to how to avoid that. Uh, so yeah, that a, uh, you know, I don't want to get on a go out on a limb where I'm giving you advice on how to run your company instead of uh, interviewing you. But just a quick thought: Would do you think of this as an alternate reality game because it it kind of meets the criteria for one, it, it, albeit a short one? We do a little bit, although the idea we've always felt is it like an ARG alternate reality game uh, for one person. Yeah, uh, most, right. most ARGs are kind of designated as this sort of mass community thing where you know basically the whole internet is playing these ARGs, and it's they're sort of designed to be solved you know, by these huge communities online, which can be a lot of fun and it's interesting. But the problem with it is that, uh, you know, and I mentioned this to my wife, for example, and she, what, what she got from it was this idea of, it's like, I had to go on some internet forum and hang out with like weird people on the internet to try and figure out this puzzle. Yeah. Um, to her, that was not at all interesting. Whereas the idea of something that appears to be directed only at you, you know, it's a private experience that you are getting you know, and yeah, you know, as far as you know, it's unique. Um, that's different, I think. It's, and I think some people like that community, you know, puzzle solving aspect. But there are other people who kind of don't want to go and hang out on this thing and spend forty hours a week deciphering codes and looking for URLs. Uh, the puzzles for that kind of ARG, they by necessity had to be incredibly hard because they basically had to be the sort of thing that hundreds of people on the internet can spend weeks on before they can solve it. Yeah which means if you don't have hundreds of hours to spend, in some ways you're just kind of observing because you don't have the uh, the time to spend on it. So am I totally off base and like Michael Douglas is the game, right? Yep. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, like that. that's like the thing that just pops in my head is that kind of paranoid. Oh, that was 100% one of the inspirations for the company was trying to replicate that experience in real life as much as is possible, which is, you know, we don't have I mean, clearly that movie was a little bit uh, implausible. You know, we don't have armies of ninjas to yeah, you're not gonna shoot anybody with fake bullets. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're not going to lock you in a cab and drop you into the San Francisco Bay or whatever, <laughs> um, or, or in a dusty uh, Mexican town or anything like that. Uh, I remember, like, there was a, a game. This was like this was more than twenty years ago, where someone like made a golden dragon or something like that, and they hid it somewhere in the U.S. And they left out a breadcrumb trail of clues, and the person who won could go find the golden dragon. Yeah, there's a couple of various things like that. They are again in that ARG category, in a sense. Sometimes they're like, I mean, sometimes they're they're just a treasure hunt. Uh, sometimes they're a bit more, you know, like they're pretending that this is part of some sort of evil conspiracy or whatever. Uh, you know, typically they're promotional for something like a, and that's one of the problems is that those of ARGs have become identified heavily with promotional stuff, where you figure. Oh, this weird thing. Oh, what's it promoting? Is this for the new Spider-Man movie or the new whatever? So they people have been conditioned in some ways to expect it to be a sales pitch of some sort, which is yeah, you know, not necessarily a bad thing, but it does mean that you know it's not quite the same experience as when you're getting something weird in the mail that you just have no idea where it came from. Pete, so you have that, a question? Yeah. So that level of paranoia that you're working for? Yeah. You nailed it. Oh, it worked for you? <laughs> oh yeah. Because I would get the packages and I was like, I would like hide them from my family. Oh, could they would you're worried they'd be scared or that well, I, you know, you, I was a little bit paranoid about it and you know, there's some freaky stuff. Mm. And I have a I have a high level of tolerance for freaky. Mm. My wife not so much. Yeah. And, well, oh go ahead. And my kids not so much either. And so so I would hide them from them, and I had created like a little box. And when I got the little um, the jump drive, mm. 
I wouldn't put it into any of my computers. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I can see yeah. why. And so I ended up, I went to Apple and did it there. Ah, okay. That was the, I think that was a Century Beast, right? That was like, yeah. a, yes. it was like a, an audio of a, a sailor getting attacked by Cthulhu, basically. Yes. Yeah. And then, you know, and all this is going on. And what I don't know is that it's my wife that bought it for me. Ah, uh, okay. She's yeah. So. Watching me do all this stuff. She knows what's going on. That's and yeah, I just keep getting more and more paranoid about it. We have a lot of scenarios like that where people are, yeah, someone in the household is basically masterminding it. And, and sometimes they, they they'll play along, you know, and they'll yeah, they'll kind of uh, you know, they'll 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 do other stuff to emphasize the believability of the things like it's like you know, have you heard about this thing? I've heard of some stories about uh, sea monsters. Uh, you know, and you're like, what? That's what really yeah. So we get packages in the mail all the time. I collect a lot of books. I collect, I collect Lovecraftian crap. Mm -hmm. You know, just so stuff comes all the time. But this was stuff that she was watching me get, and like hiding away. Oh yeah, because yeah. you were you were you were not quite. I mean, I, I assume you didn't really think it was quote unquote real no no but you didn't quite know where I, I think that's the experience we get it's like you know there's a tiny percent chance that some people think maybe it's real but a lot of just are like you know i don't think it's real but but you can't figure out who would go to the trouble to fake such a thing exactly so just on an aside on friday i got an email from some guy in key west talking about chemtrails mm -hmm. and you know that he's dead serious so, you know, that's the kind of freaky stuff that you guys are putting together. And yeah, there's a weird sense out there of not knowing exactly where the weirdness, like, yeah, is it, it's less a matter of do you believe in UFOs, but you certainly believe in people who believe in UFOs. Exactly. And that can be a little freaky too. So, right. and that, so that's the line I'm run, I was running with this. And you, you nailed that really, really well. Well, we try to, I mean, we, we, we aim for truthiness in the sense that obviously the stuff isn't real, but we do aim for it to be realistic enough that it takes, it would take you a lot of work to kind of definitively prove that an individual item is fake. So, exactly. so yeah, it is true. I mean, like if you get a, if you get a thing that appears to be a diary of a crazy, you know, uh, possessed person, oh yeah, you know, that's not really handwritten, but we've done our best to make it look as authentic as we can. And, and I think in most cases these days, we, we managed to hit that level. Yeah. You know, if you had a, once in a while we'll get people who are like, I don't know, handwriting, you know, experts or other stuff, you know, who, who will like say, oh yeah, when I was looking at this thing with a microscope, I could tell that it was, you know, printed on a whatever rather than handwritten or something. Yeah. But yeah, my CSI lab busted you, yeah. buddy. <laughs> Yeah, well, actually, uh, that, that leads to some, as you mentioned, as, as far as like stories about people getting freaked out, we have a large catalog of stories like that for the company involving, oh, I don't know, the NSA. Someone sent a package to a diplomat, and he reported to the NSA. Uh, they investigated, and interestingly, he sent us their report, which was uh, basically concluded suspicious, but not an imminent threat. And, <laughs> not <so> imminent. <laughs> Yeah, so Wait, but not imminent. When that's, that's a Rick, wives. Rick. Uh, okay, when you're hired to do this, does the uh, client say, "I want to send this person something Lovecraftian or something voodoo"? Or uh, yeah, whatever? there's a variety of we have a, we have a range of these different experiences. Uh, we have a couple of different kind of Lovecrafty ones. We have a King and Yellow one, a uh, at least one Cthulhu related one, technically two. And a couple other horror ones are a little bit more, uh, you know, different genres. We've got a couple of science fiction ones. We've got kind of a time travel uh, love story. We've got some sort of adventure ones, you know, like Indiana Jones style, you know, ancient Egypt kind of puzzling. A uh, couple, uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah. We, we try to, you know, range across different, you know, different kind of genres and interests. Uh, horror is definitely the most popular one for us. And Cthulhu type stuff, Lovecraftian also really big, but, but yeah, as, as you mentioned, some people, you know, they may not, they may want something less scary. Um, so we, we try to have a, a range of stuff that you can get. What was this? I'm not trying to like do too much of a tangent. There was like a game in the nineties void majeure or something. Uh, like that. Uh, majestic. Majestic. No, I, yeah, well, yeah, it's one I was trying to think of too. I, I, I think that they kind of, sorry, go ahead. 
Oh, yeah, that was a big influence as well. They, uh, but they weren't around things. very long at all, if I remember correctly. No, I think it was a commercial failure, um, but it was really interesting. Again, that was a video game that it kind of was, well, it was not only a video game, but it also kind of tied into all sorts of weird conspiracy stuff. You get phone calls from these. Yeah, I remember getting phone through. calls from these guys. And it sort of had a pretty cool. <laughs> website thing where you browse around on this fake internet. Um, it was definitely really, an, it was kind of ahead of its time in some ways. I think it didn't, I don't think they quite figured out how to make it, you know, work commercially, but it's definitely a really cool idea. Yeah. It was influence. I feel like the occult packages and diaries is probably a little bit more exciting because I mean, you don't have to pay anyone money and you can get crazy emails from people, right? <laughs> like that'll, they'll just do that for you. Mm -hmm. That's part of the reason why we're, we try to make this stuff as tactile as we can. Like we do have the odd, you know, website that's thrown in there for, uh, you know, kind of extension of it. But as you said, it's kind of like crazy on the internet is in, is in, you know, pretty, you know, wide supply. So just, yeah, getting crazy emails or looking at crazy websites is not, it's, it doesn't really impress anybody. Nobody is like, you know, can you believe this crazy website? It's like, <laughs> yeah, I can believe it. You know, of course. <laughs> yeah, so, um, really weird stuff. The, the more successful, ironically, that the Mysterious Package Company becomes, uh, the harder it is to for people to experience the experiences in this way. That I is say, actually, I mean, yeah. Is really yeah I mean, I time. would say it's a good problem to have, but but still a problem. Yeah, and that's something we've been wrestling with because, yeah, this by this point now, I don't know, we I don't even have the hand number at hand, but we send like tens of thousands of packages around the world. And so, yeah, it's, it is harder to keep stuff secret in that case. Uh, I mean, you can keep making new stuff, but of course, you know, that's a production kind of challenge. Um, you can try to kind of, you know, hide stuff, but again, that's on the internet, that's sort of a difficult uh, process too. So yeah, we've been, we're, we're trying to think of different ideas of how you can maintain that sense of mystery, you know, while you still are reaching a larger and larger number of people. Uh, we've got some ideas, but it's, uh, well, I can't tell you them because then that would sort of spoil the mystery. Well, let me throw out one real quick and then we'll move on to, I want to talk to you about Lovecraft and you're interested in Lovecraft. Uh, if you want to throw another suggestion in the suggestion box, um, it is it is getting pretty well known. So, uh, you know, a slip of paper in there saying something to the effect of this is an alternate re reality game for one person. You know, don't go look up, don't spoil it for yourself. Obviously, well, uh, better said than that. But to keep them from going to the Internet and saying, you know, what the hell is this and spoiling it. Yeah, we've considered doing that. Uh, the The problem we we have is that, uh, but even even like a even a very you know straightforward little miniature you know kind of warning like that kind of gives away gives away the game by itself. As soon as you know that it's not that it's a game or uh, you know a, a manufactured product, that sort of is the big you know once you know that, then you kind of spoil the idea of of it being kind of genuine or a real crazy person. Yeah, you, you've broken the spell, I guess you'd say. Yeah, we've, we've, we've toyed with it a few times. It's just we couldn't figure out a way to, we tried, you know, we were thinking of all sorts of elaborate things, like, you know, an envelope that says, you know, do not open this envelope unless you're really, 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 really freaked out. And then, <laughs> you know, another envelope inside is saying, no, really, you know, are you totally, totally freaked out? You know, and this you should really only open this if you're, you know, really about to call the police or the FBI, you know. Or how about don't, don't, don't Google this or, you know. I don't know. Come up with something. Yeah, no, no. I mean, it's 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 an it's it's an idea that we thought of. It's just, yeah. I mean, another concern is that it might help in some cases. Although some of the worst scenarios we've had actually involve people who didn't even really read anything. Um, like again, as as you've seen, if you looked at the site, you know, we're we're quite careful with what we put in the packages. You know, obviously, you know, there's if you send anything that that looks like a bomb or purports to be a bomb, you're in you know very serious trouble for that. Yeah. Uh, and we certainly don't send anything that's directly threatening for the same reason. You know, if you're sending, it would be the easiest thing in the world to scare people by sending them, you know, a, a letter scrawled in blood saying you're next or whatever. Um, but that, you know, crosses the line from fun, scary into, you know, really scary and not very funny. Yeah. Um, but that said, sometimes people just freak out just at the sight of a weird looking box. We've had, uh, we had one, you know, case where someone got this package on their doorstep and they, 
they didn't even open it. They took it straight to a police station and said they thought it was a bomb. And I can tell you what happens if you go to a police station with a thing you tell them is a bomb, they will evacuate the building and it will be a real, it, it will be a big mess. So uh, we've had all sorts of bomb squads called, but usually they they come to your house and they'll check the thing out. And uh, yeah, they're usually actually, the, we've sold stuff to bomb squad guys because they thought it was cool once they found out what it was. So um, that, yeah, you almost have like an interesting um, click wrap, right? When you're buying this thing. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's kind of an overreaction. I I got this. I I don't know where this is. This came from. So maybe it's a bomb. <laughs> well, I can tell you, there's been occasions like with that stuff in Austin um, last year where we, you know, where there were there was someone, you know, putting bombs on doorsteps. Yeah, uh, it's true. And we immediately was like, oh my god, you know, make sure check everything we got going to Texas, and you know, you know, that's not going to be a funny surprise for anybody right now. So make sure we. You know, contact the people and let them know, you know, that this is coming. And so it's not going to be, you know, oh, funny package on my doorstep. You know, it won't be very hilarious at that time. Um, and again, when people buy this stuff for people, we we have a lot of disclaimers and warnings to them saying, you know, like, you know, if you're buying a horror, one of the scary ones, you're saying, okay, this is scary. Be careful who you're sending it to. Make sure that they, you know, either you warn them if you're worried or that you know that the kind of person who will enjoy this, don't send it to you or you're, you're you know, your aunt with PTSD or, you know, someone who's being stalked by an ex-boyfriend or whatever. Uh, so we try to make sure that people are aware of what they're doing and not, you know, you want it to be a little bit scary, but in a fun way and not a not a genuinely terrifying way. So, so one of your newer ones is the Crate of Cthulhu. Before we get into that, can, you, can we start off with uh, your interest in Lovecraft and the mythos? How did that begin for you? Uh, gosh, I mean, um, I probably I was reading Lovecraft stuff, I guess, as probably a lot of you guys were in my you know, uh, teen years, you know, same way a lot of people do reading science fiction and whatever, and then coming across H.P. Lovecraft and just kind of, you know, plowing through all the Cthulhu mythos stuff. Uh, I kind of was a big fan, of, again, of a lot of other horror fiction that was kind of related, particularly Ramsey Campbell. He did a lot of Cthulhu uh, mythos related stories. Um, yeah, and then that's kind of, you know, and then sort of just maintain interest in horror fiction in general. And that kind of, I guess, what's become now this, as you said, this sort of Lovecraftian uh, genre, subgenre. It's, it's a, you know, I'm not quite sure how you define it now. It's become so broad that you have, you know, Cthulhu plushies and kids' books and children's movies and all this other, you know, material. So it's, it's kind of spawned a cottage industry of its own. Uh, but again, I, I still, I still like going back to the original material the lovecraft you know text itself which is interesting because i think a lot of people now they know they know what cthulhu is but they may not have ever ever read the call of cthulhu yeah uh which is kind of what going back to our product there which is kind of why that that creative cthulhu was our attempt to basically take the call of cthulhu and turn it into a physical experience of the sort that we we do as kind of because it is basically the story is presented as a a found narrative you know it's presented as a you know a, a manuscript uh, within a manuscript basically it's, it's this layered set of like diaries and journals and newspaper clippings and all these things so you know it was it was very possible to make that into a you know a, a manuscript that we sort of made as a you know a typewritten aged document and then uh, it was also centered around a lot of these interesting artifacts from you know little bass reliefs to newspaper clippings to you know to again the the statue that's referenced so prominently in the story the six inch you know whatever eight inch uh you know cthulhu statuette and again that's something that we have done a lot of and it seemed like that would be a, a, an opportunity to kind of really pull all the stops out and create what we hope was going to be just an amazing cthulhu statue as the centerpiece of this and so that's what this guy was and people who are I guess, coming can see it and you can describe it if you want, but it's actually quite a hefty 12-inch Cthulhu statue. Yeah, you might you might be better at describing it than me. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I mean, it's it's painted. Yeah, the artist is. And... Oh, Who's the artist? Uh, a guy in uh, Vancouver. His name is Gideon Hay. He's uh, done a lot of work in movies, doing various monsters and so on. So he's uh, he's done a fair number of Cthulhu's of his own and. So uh, I'd, I'd worked with him in the past and sort of said, okay, well, you know, we want this to look kind of like a, 
you know, like a, a, a statue, so slightly stylized, as but but still kind of you know old and definitely with sort of this sort of a handmade aged beat up quality to it. And then uh, I think yeah, that's one of my the favorite one of my favorite Cthulhu idols that I've seen, and I've um, seen quite a few of them. Yeah, there's quite there are a lot, and I've seen many of them, and you know, and they range from like the one on your shelf back there, kind of a coin bank thing. Uh, to various one-offs, to sort of you know action figure type stuff, but again, we wanted to have something that looked like it maybe could have been the one described in the story. You know, something that could look like it was made out of greenish black stone, that would look normal, that would look uh, appropriate sitting on some sort of shrine in a Louisiana swamp cult. You know, um, as best we could. And again, we've done a fair bit of this kind of stuff before with aging and making stuff look you know, kind of crusty and old. So yeah, so we put a lot of work into, uh, you know, appropriately, you know, mangling it so it didn't look, you know, shiny and new, but look kind of like a thrashed uh, piece of stone. So Jason, uh, if I understand you correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, but the thought behind this particular experience was to bring the Call of Cthulhu story more or less to life. Yeah, yeah. And then to, to make that's it- a, That's such a neat idea. Yeah, so the idea is in this case, and we, we'd have to do a little bit of um, surrounding material for it. So what you get is you'll get a big crate, and the crate uh, is labeled as if it came from the Natural History Museum in London, which is kind of, according to the story, was was sort of one of the one of the locations where the, the statue in the story had ended up. Yeah. Um, and then we have a little bit of a backstory on how it made its way from there uh, to the mysterious package company, along with the materials and documents from the the writer, you know, of the uh, Call of Cthulhu, nominally, you know, the the character in the story. Uh, so a little bit of this backstory, how the, all this stuff ended up in the in the hands of the NPC, and now it's over to you. And there's sort of this hint about the Cthulhu cult, you know, maybe being aware of the existence of this artifact and kind of you know wanting to kind of you know, prevent it from getting out into the world and, you know, keeping it secret. So, uh, yes, yeah, so we wanted to make it as, as if this was a real thing, as if the Call of Cthulhu had really happened and, and you know, all the artifacts from it were real and the newspaper clippings referenced in the story, like about the alert, uh, the ship. Uh, we, you know, we've got a fake version of that newspaper clipping that's sort of aged to look like it's from the 1920s. Um, we've got a little tin, again, as described in the story with a bunch of these, you know, uh, various clippings and bits and pieces like the clay bass relief from the crazy artist. He basically made, you know, a similar, you know, kind of clay thing and put it in the box. So yeah, basically trying to make as if it was, if, if it had really happened, this might be the sort of thing that had been sitting in a, you know, underneath a staircase in the Natural History Museum in London for the last 70 years until someone had, you know, uh, you know, dug it up and decided to send it to you. Now, you're uh, offering thirty dollars off for the Lovecraft Easing audience, correct? Uh, yes. Yeah. Will you I tell them so. how to get that? Well, you would uh, go to the Mysterious Package Company's website. I think we have a special URL, which is mysteriouspackage.com/cthulhu. And when you check out with it, uh, you enter the code Lovecraft thirty, and okay. that would uh, and that would give you thirty dollars off. Does that have to be in caps? You sent it to me in caps, the Lovecraft uh, 30. I don't think so. Uh, I hope not. I haven't tried it. But <laughs> if it doesn't work, try it in caps. And then so mysteriouspackage.com slash Cthulhu. Yep. And what all do you get with that? You get, uh, you get coin, a, a challenge coin. Yeah, you get a lot of, well, I think there's a bunch of, I think you have to, there's a couple of different options, I think. But uh, the I think there's a few add-ons we can get like a, a coin, a challenge coin for Cthulhu and the uh, occult ring, which has a secret compartment for poison or I guess whatever else you might want to put in it. Yeah, I'm looking at a picture of that ring right now. That looks awesome. <laughs> it is pretty neat, actually. We were looking around. We wanted to do, I mean, then that's technically not, I mean, isn't, that's one of those things we're extrapolating a bit from the story and that that's not specifically in the story, but it is implied that the cult is murdering people with some sort of untraceable poison. And so we thought it would be kind of appropriate to have a something like a ring with a Cthulhu, you know, a sigil on it that opens up to contain some sort of, again, poisonous uh, material. So that's just sort of a cool object to have. Yeah. Um, how long does it usually take to ship? Somebody orders it. When can they, 
more or less expect it? Um, it varies for some of our packages. Some of them are kind of a little more handcrafted and put together and customized. Uh, this one, conveniently enough, we actually just got our a, a giant shipment of our statues in uh, last week, and so I think it would ship out nearly immediately. So it would be probably in the mail within a week if after you bought it. Uh, now, it's been about two months. Tisa told me that there were limited qualities on this. Has, has that changed? Have you gotten more... Have you created more? Uh, we have got more that just came in. So it's still, I mean, all our stuff is still limited quantity to some extent in that we're not, you know, it's not mass uh, manufactured or whatever. So uh, we, right. we definitely have, uh, and, and we have some pre-orders and so forth. So there's definitely some available. And, uh, you know, how long the last is hard to predict because a lot of it depends on, you know, how many we sell and so forth. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're definitely available for now. And then, when things go to print, you may have to wait a while uh, for us to get a new shipment. But, uh, but yeah, this one's been pretty popular, so I think we'll I imagine we'll keep uh, keep uh, keep it in stock. You may have to get back ordered for a little bit. Yeah, Rick, you have a question? I don't know. You there, Rick? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you're servicing the HP Lovecraft fan. But uh, what 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 about the Robert E. Howard fan? <laughs> um, I have a good go. suggestion for you if you if you like. Uh, I'm sure. We, I mean, we do have a King in Yellow product, so that's not that's not Howard, but it is definitely we 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 branched out into into other related. Well, uh, there is a, there is a story by Robert E. Howard, a Conan story, which is about a mysterious package called the God in the Bowl. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that one. Yeah. You could do a variation on that. Yeah, that would be an interesting one. Um, the challenge with we've, – we've debated some of these fantasy ones before, you know, like doing a package based on any, you know, any, any of these various fantasy-type properties or just even concepts. Uh, I mean, one issue, of course, is public domain issues, and, you know, Lovecraft is pretty, pretty safe in that regard. I'm not 100% sure about Howard. I don't know if well, you, well, you could change the Gia, replace the Gia with Egypt, and uh, oh, yeah, you say, could, yeah, you know, I, he's, 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 the God said is a uh, oh, he's not real, copyrighted, he's not copyrighted, no, but I think Conan might be so, yeah, I don't yeah think. you couldn't use Conan, but you could make it yeah. sound like a Conan story, yeah. They, I think that would we could the other issue we'd have with fantasy stuff with that was also. The plausibility factor of figuring out a way, you know, how was it that that this uh, package from ancient Hyperborea or Narnia or wherever, how did it exactly end up in the uh, postal system? You know, who 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 put that in a box and mailed it to you? We how got archaeologists from Egypt. We also, I mean, you also had the problem of like, unlike the Lovecraft package where the person like doesn't want it to be real. I mean, if I get a package from like a Magic Kingdom. And I find out it's fake. I'm going to be pissed. I'm like, where's? I want to go to Hogwarts. Let's go this right might now. Be right a now. Bad, <laughs> this might be a bad time for me to talk to you about the Easter Bunny, Kurt. Uh oh. No. Yeah. Well, it's just like funny, like that idea of like a fantasy kingdom package, like the you know the, the jokes is like the Harry Potter letter, but like um, Terry Brooks wrote those great books, uh, Magic Kingdom for Sale, yep. which is. That whole plot line of this guy like just gets a letter from a lawyer saying, "Hey, do you want to buy a fairy kingdom?" Yep. Oh, no, and we actually have done one. We did. Um, we did actually. Uh, we have an experience uh, called Taco, which is a collaboration with these podcast guys, the McElroys. They have a uh, kind of a Dungeons and Dragons podcast thing called the Adventure Zone, and uh, it's pretty popular. And they're they're fans of ours. And yeah, we basically did a collaboration with them, and it was uh, based on this character of theirs called Taco, who is uh, sort of a uh, border sort of a scoundrel wizard, and it's it's sort of a it's kind of a comical thing. It's basically a parody of Harry Potter school. It's essentially a, a cheap correspondence uh, school for wizards. <laughs> uh, that's sort of how online, we did the, online yeah, YouTube classes for magic. <laughs> yeah, it's basically the budget cut rate Hogwarts kind of thing, and you know, and, and they're intentionally referencing it as being like kind of. It, it's clearly, you know, the, you know, kind of sketchy. And in fact, as it turns out, you know, he, the uh, the wizard has some ulterior motives for selling you this kind of, you know, theoretically bogus magic course. Um, so yeah, there's there's Isn't ways to do that. 
Isn't that the plot of Bedknobs and Broomsticks? Uh, yeah, well, I, well, there are, there definitely are ways to get these magic packages from some theoretical fantasy kingdom to the real world. You know, you can definitely have the, you know, the the classic. Uh, you know, your uncle left you this magic ring or magic belt or magic key to the wardrobe or whatever. So there's ways. It, it's easier for some of those like the Narnia type things where you already posit, you know, a way from our world to this fantasy world. It'd be harder for something like a Lord of the Rings or a Game of Thrones type deal where. Right. Uh, it doesn't really make it, it would be pretty out of character to have, you know, a modern, you know, teenager suddenly warp into uh, Westeros or something. Right. Now, I was just thinking that, you know, the, the plot behind Ben Downs and Bruce is he's taking a mail order sorcery course. Oh, is it? Yeah, I don't remember that. Huh. Yeah, that makes sense. And then she can't get the last um, lesson because the war broke out. Oh, I did not. I mean, I remember bed knobs and broomsticks. I didn't remember the setup for it. Mm -hmm. So, okay. yeah, I mean, for ideally for us, anything that ties into mail or that sort of stuff is an easy access for us to kind of make stuff seem plausible. One of my one of my favorite stories of all time is about this guy who realizes that every letter he sends, the further it goes, the faster it gets there. So he finally just addresses a letter to Alpha Centauri. <laughs> and two guys show up at the door and say, "Congratulations, you are now part of Galactic Society." Oh, okay, yeah, that's yeah, that's kind of a good gag. I think I was I was like, the, wasn't that the gag? And uh, for, some, for some reason, it reminds me of that Good Omens gag that they oh, yeah. have, where uh, every every car back in the eighties magically has a copy of Queen's Greatest Hits in the yeah. uh, or every every cassette stuck in a in a in the stereo of an eighties car turns into Queen's Greatest Hits. Correct. Within like thirty minutes or something. Right. So do y'all have like a fantasy package where it just says, you know, I don't know how to tell you this, but you're the chosen one and like you're a part of this grand prophecy and you need to do... <laughs> I'm trying to think of something I could send to Alex at this point. Uh, I think a lot of them kind of have that sort of narrative of one story. Nice. <laughs> you, you're the only one. <laughs> oh, they're, they're, they're usually centered around something like that. Like, like, like I think a couple of them are essentially, you know, there's a curse of some sort, and you are the only one who can break the curse because you're the, you're the descendant of so and so and so. Oh. Uh, I think the I think the Egypt one might be like that, or uh, yeah, there's there's a couple that is a common one that we use. I think the time travel one again is you're the only one who can reunite these lovers who've been sort of separated via time travel. Uh, yeah, so it's it's we kind of want to make people feel like they are a potential savior rather than again the the threatening ones where we have to be careful of where we do have a couple that are a bit ominous we have one called the demon jar which i i quite like but it scared a few people in that it's a it's kind of a, a big metal jar uh but it's got a it's got a cage on it and the cage has this combination lock and the the background that you get with it is that nominally supposedly someone has locked a demon in this in this jar via uh, runes written on a piece of human skin and you're you're told you know whatever you do don't open it, um, but you can decipher a code to get the the combination to the lock, and so you can open it. Um, but you have to kind of you know break a seal and all this stuff. And if you do, you know sure enough, well we don't have the demon in the jar, but we do actually have something that looks a lot like human skin with runes written on it. So uh, yeah, that's been an interesting one to see who some people will not open it, and other people you know obviously really really want to open it and check what's inside. Um, we, we've been toying with ideas for the future of doing things like, uh, you know, having more high tech stuff so that you could have a bottle like that sort of make rattling noises at 2 a.m., you know, at, at random on your bookshelf. Oh, that's. <laughs> um, I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you something about do maybe adolescents enjoy this a lot because they're not quite sure if it's true or not. And, and I also came across on the experiences page on your website. This is pretty funny. Uh, the taco one that you were referencing. Yeah. And it says save $999,925.01. Yeah. So yeah, that's discount for the, yeah, you're discounted to four ninety nine. dollars yeah. uh, what, what is that one? Is that one meant sp specifically for kids? What is um, that exactly? Not well. It's it's a it's more kid friendly for sure. Although not entirely. It's again, it's from those McElroy guys who do their podcast for D and D, uh, and it's not. I would say it's somewhat more kid friendly, but they do still sometimes use moderately blue language. 
So it's uh, kid friendly ish. Um, some of our other ones are again the, the Egypt one and uh, a couple other ones are, are are noted as being more family friendly. We yeah when we have stuff that's like explicitly scary, we try to call it out so that people don't uh, send it to their kids unless they're very sure. Uh, it is true that I mean like teenagers kind of might be you know a, a precocious teenager might be more in with it, but at the same time you do want to be careful about sending that to kids who might get overly terrified by right. you know, stuff. So, and ultimately we can, we can do our best to guide people, but you know, if you're buying a gift for someone at some stage, you, you're the one who has to know who the gift is for and, and, you know, kind of make some calls on that. Um, all right. So the March madness stuff is over, right? That Lovecraft bundle that's no longer available or is it still? Um, good question. I think they're doing a couple of, I think they've got a couple different bundles going on right now. And some, actually there's some other new products. We just have, uh, we just announced a dragon's tooth, which has just been put up for pre-sale, I believe, which, uh, may have been timed to coincide with a certain TV show, uh, <laughs> which is, you know, coming to an ending. Um, and that's actually, it, that's an interesting one. We actually had, we had started working on that a couple years ago and it got backburnered because of uh, production problems, we couldn't get a good enough looking dragon's tooth, but uh, we managed to bring that back and kind of uh, complete it. And so, yeah, that, that was a fun one. That's again, it's, it's a little bit like the Cthulhu one in that it's not so much a mystery what you're gonna get. It's pretty clear, you know, it's a dragon's tooth. It's uh, yeah. but, but it comes with lots of interesting material, kind of like manuals and documents about the authenticity of your dragon's tooth and kind of a, um, a stand to display your dragon's tooth on uh, a bunch of history on this sort of Draco Venatoris, this sort of ancient dragon hunting society and the ecology of these, you know, theoretical dragons. So it's, it's kind of a fun one. And that's, it's positing this sort of alternate reality in which, you know, in which dragons are a, you know, kind of an expensive, uh, you know, kind of a game animal, but you might actually find them. And there's definitely, and they've, they become rare and endangered and stuff like that. So finding these dragon's teeth is no longer as, as easy as it one, once was. A couple of questions on the website. First question is, and I'm not criticizing because maybe I'm just missing it. The experiences page doesn't seem to have everything you're, you're, you've referenced. Um, it could be, again, I, I've, they're, they're right in the middle of, I think, the the pre-order for the dragon's tooth and some of these other ones, okay. so some stuff, and we do kind of cycle some things in and out. So some okay. stuff kind of comes and goes depending on the season. So that makes I mean, sense. Sure. Yeah. I, 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 I'm not totally up to date with what's there today because we keep modifying things, but and then uh, the next question uh, under curiosities, this is really interesting. Um, you've got what looks like stories. You've got, uh, an artifact or two, the King in Yellow book, uh, Gods of Madness, for example, twisted tales and unimaginable collectibles that explore the world of madness in Victorian London. Like, yeah, maybe start with that one. Tell, tell us about these. Um, some of those, yeah, those are kind of our, the curiosities are kind of our, as the name suggests, sort of a weird grab bag of, of things. Uh, the Gods of Madness one is one of our uh, cures and conundrums, which was a a quarterly a subscription package that we ran a few years ago. Um, yeah, we ran that. Uh, it was sort of an. It was a kind of. A, it was meant to be kind of a loot crate for a somewhat more literary and kind of odd crowd. Yeah. And so it kind of came with lots of weird objects in it. Some of them like pewter statuettes of tentacles and uh, paper craft constructions of Victorian insane asylums on fire. Uh, a little newspaper with a whole bunch of bizarre stories in it. Um, just all sorts of strange, weird trinkets and oddities. So yeah, we did that for a year, a couple years. And um, so we still have some of those in sort of in, in stock. So they're still kind of interesting to kind of uh, to check out now. They're, they're, they're all, yeah, we have a lot of weird stuff that we've done over the years. <laughs> weird is good. I really like this, the look of this uh, king in yellow pendant. Oh yeah, we've uh, King and Yellow has been around for quite a while. We're actually well, I uh, can't announce anything yet, but uh, it's it's we're, we're we've been interested in doing more stuff with the King and Yellow and that sort of related mythos for a while. So we have another product called Carcosa, which is somewhat related, and uh, we may have something coming up pretty soon, which is also once again King and Yellow kind of uh, uh, related material. 
So that. Oh, yep. There's a beautiful s stone rose from one of his stories. Uh, I don't know if I remember that. Which what story is that? Uh, Rick, help me out. The mask. The mask. Yes. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Huh? Yeah, we've done some stuff. Uh, we've done some weird masks again, inspired by that. Uh, yeah. Let me let me take a look at that again. We I, we do like the idea of trying to again make literal objects that are referenced in these fantastic stories as much as we can. So I, I think there's even a stone goldfish as well. Yes, there is. It's, it's a fish at least. Yeah, yeah, th yeah. Those would all be cool items. Again, there's some stuff we can do. Some stuff it becomes, you know, it's one of those things where it's, it's surprising. Some stuff, weirdly, you know, a a big stone statue like this is possible. Sometimes stuff like a golden a gold ring would be more difficult because obviously, right. you know, it's the problem with that would be you know, certain ones you can make them look believable. Other ones you can't make them look believable on a budget. Right, that makes sense. So we end up with a lot of logistics issues around the idea of like, you know, can we, this would be cool, but can we make it? And if we can make yeah. it, will it cost a thousand dollars? And yeah. and can you reproduce it in a consistent yeah. manner? And yeah. and sometimes the shipping is like, you know, some stuff would be cool, but if it was gonna weigh 40 pounds, you know, it's gonna be hard to uh, send it to people. So it's an interesting challenge to make these things, you know, like I say, under the statue, this is pretty hefty, but we've done some tests with other statues where we'd, we got the manufacturer and we did all the stuff and then they came back and they look great. But if you pick them up, they weighed like two ounces and they're yeah. basically hollow. Yeah. And it's like, well, that doesn't work um, because it needs to feel right. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference. We, we have some people from, you know, prop guys from movies have done stuff for us. And the, the difference that they find is that in the movies stuff is like a lot of it's made out of foam because all it has to do is look good, you know, on film from a hundred feet away. Mm -hmm. Um, and afterwards, it's just in the garbage. But our stuff has to kind of feel feel pretty pretty plausible when you're holding it, and that means things like weight and and just the tactile uh, nature of it. So I think, uh, yeah, I don't know when it, when it works. We've seen things like, yeah, I think we had a statue that got stopped at customs a bunch of times because they thought it was a genuine Peruvian, you know, uh, <laughs> and they're like, you can't export you can't export these without a license or whatever. And it's like, well. It's not actually, it's not real. Um, That's free marketing uh, right there. <laughs> I, I had my, I had my luggage opened by airport security because it has like a Thulu piggy bank. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, they they they'll check on a lot of things. We and we oh, that's an, actually another issue we have for sending certain things. There's certain artifacts we've wanted to do, but stuff we well, certain things. Liquid is a bad idea. Be in trouble for that. Food is a bad idea. Uh, weapons of any sort, you know, knives or replica firearms will get you in trouble when you cross borders with that. So uh, yeah, there's 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 a there's a yeah one big part of the whole mysterious package company is just all the logistics of of manufacturing and shipping and all this sort of stuff. So that's uh, it's one thing to make up weird stuff, but once you cross the line from digital into physical, there are all sorts of extra challenges that. Uh, you know, that you that are not obvious at first. Well, I want to point out again under curiosities at the Mysterious Package Company's website. Uh, for example, the uh, the the Cult of Cthulhu ring is uh, twenty six dollars and some odd cents. The yellow sign pendant is twenty four ninety nine, and they both look superb. So you can, you know. Yeah, no, I think they're pretty good. I mean, they're, yeah, I mean, they're, they, I think you can get them both, depending on what package you get, sometimes there'll be offers to get them in a, in a bundle with the other stuff. So that's just the sort of the standalone cost. Right. Um, but yeah, no, we, we've done our best with those to kind of try and make them. Again, it's not just to make them look, part of the challenge is making them look kind of messed up in that, you know, brand new shiny stuff is actually easier than trying to get something that looks kind of, you know, uh, beat up and antique. So yeah, we've done. We have all sorts of weird things that we do for antiquing. Basically, there's for for paper. Uh, we've got a whole tea dyeing room because we found that the best way to make paper look old is to dunk it in tea and then let it dry. But we have all sorts of different tea and and different lengths of of time to leave it in the tea. Um, yeah, so there's a little, there's literally a whole room with like hundreds and hundreds of pages of paper drying from tea to get the right uh, look. Because it's just uh, you can't really, 
you know, you, you everyone's probably seen these things, products, mass market stuff, where they've you know printed off some paper to look like it's supposed to be old, but it doesn't really, you know, doesn't matter how good of a print job it is, it's still, you know, it's clearly modern regular paper that you printed with some brownish, you know, patterns. Yeah. That's so, nuts. The uh, in South Carolina, there's all this pirate stuff everywhere, and I remember as a kid, um, all that like tea-soaked paper. That's yeah. so funny that that's still the technique. We tried all sorts of different things. It's still the best. Yeah. Um, there's we yeah we've got there's lots of kind of quasi trade secrets about some of this stuff about how to I don't know like there's like little tricks like for trying to fake handwriting. We've tried all sorts of weird things for that. Uh, we do some stuff now where, you know, we, we print some stuff, but you'll print some things with a different printer and a different ink. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have someone go over some parts of it with an actual pen. So you get that pressure mark and, you know, kind of some sort of uh, bleed through and that sort of thing. There's just, uh, we, we toyed with the idea of getting a robot pen. They have these robot pens that they use for certain things where there's a little CNC arm that holds a pen and actually signs things. Oh, yeah, like a little, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but unfortunately, they they work for like signatures. They use them for things like banks and politicians, but they uh, they don't. <laughs> well, it's like if you wrote to you know if you write to like a, a high level politician, you might get an answer back that's signed by them, probably signed by one of these robots, basically, so they can legally say it was signed by this person in some way that works out. Well, you know, um, it's like unless you're like going to straight up have vellum, right? Like you're going to have skin. <laughs> it's not going to. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, no. It's, yeah, we've we have yeah, paper is a whole interesting challenge for us. Like some of the things, it's actually a challenge to get crappy paper because most of the paper nowadays is a lot better than the paper that you they were using for things like forty years ago. I mean, that was the whole. Pulp, I mean, Pulp Fiction, right? That was the whole deal. Yeah. Why all these old uh, paperbacks kind of have the look that they do is because they were printed on crappy paper because they were they had various shortages and stuff. Uh, I think you know, kind of during the wars and then, then after that. Uh, so trying to replicate that kind of crappy paper is hard because most modern printing houses literally don't have paper that cheap. So I was, I was really impressed with the qual the lack of quality of your, the comic book paper in the, in the century. BC. Oh, Alan, yeah. Yeah. I think that was, a, I think it was actually a newsprint. So that was like the best compromise we had to make something look kind of like that kind of, uh, uh, the comic book paper from the again that modern comics are not printed on that modern yeah. comics are printed on much nicer paper jason is the only person who will ever take that as a compliment <laughs> yeah no it's, it's uh, <laughs> no yeah we, we're, we're looking around for stuff i think we found occasionally like someone will have like a, a big a pallet full of of like you know 40 year old you know paper that's been sitting there and it's all you know kind of mangy looking and we're like you know get that we want that get that pallet print our stuff on that you know, because it's got that sort of genuine, you know, it, that's an easier way to do it than trying to do all this tea dyeing and other stuff if you actually find really crappy paper. But yeah, um, yeah no, anyway, that's, I, I don't want too much into the trade craft or whatever, but. Uh, um, well, okay, so the, uh, just as a reminder, if anybody wants out there listening wants the Cthulhu crate, crate of Cthulhu, excuse me, just go to mysteriouspackage.com slash Cthulhu. Do I have that right? That's correct. Mysterious Package. Uh, forget about the company part. MysteriousPackage.com slash Cthulhu. Yep. Um, you know, while you're there, check out the other experiences. Check and, out the curiosities. Yeah. And use the code Lovecraft30. Yes, thank you. Uh, absolutely. Now, the other thing is, you mentioned you cycle things through, you put new stuff out, and so on and so forth. What is the best way for people to keep track of that? Do you have a Facebook page? Is there some um, we'll better it. way? Or well, our our newsletter is is updated quite a lot, and usually that's where we do all the pre orders and early releases and sales. So that's definitely by far the best way to keep up with all the the stuff we're doing. So we do have a Facebook page and a Twitter account and Instagram. Um, but yeah, we, we, we put a lot of work into the newsletter, so that's probably the best way to kind of, uh, stay up to date. Okay. Um, maybe I'm just missing it, but I just want to make sure everyone else finds it. Um, where is the newspaper? Uh, uh, newsletter? newsletter. uh, good question. It should be somewhere on the, somewhere on the page there. Yeah. I see experiences, curiosities, gift cards and so forth. Um, and then the cart, but I don't see the newsletter. Oh, I think you join. I think if you join, basically. Oh, uh, okay. 
Yeah, right. if you sign up, that it's it's got the uh, check mark there to to uh, get the emails. So that's probably the that oh, easiest. I see it. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, folks, click the join button, and you can. You, that doesn't mean you have to buy anything. Just um, sign up for it, and you'll be kept in the loop as to what's going on. And we sent some pretty. We sent some odd stuff by email too. That's that's where we can be a little more secretive these days. Because again, putting stuff on the, once it's out on the web it's sort of easily crawled by various search engines. Whereas the newsletters, we can do slightly odder stuff without it necessarily getting out to the uh, internet at large. Uh, Rick, did you have another question or was that an, or was that a, I don't think you can hear me. Um, I, can, I can hear you. Okay. It takes me a while to unmute. No problem. I wanted to just ask, is there any situation which is uh, too frightening that you wouldn't do for the serious package? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, for sure. I mean, I think the big one is that we, we, we've, we're we steering very, very clear of, like, serial killers or anything, you know, that's sort of very real world could be happening right now to you. Again, it would be extremely easy to send someone a package that, you know, purported to be from a serial killer you know, uh, with a bunch of, you know, scary stuff in it. But that I think would be, that would run the risk again of, of getting into a unfunny sort of scary rather than sort of fun. So we, we tend, we try to keep everything in this sort of either science fiction or occult or uh, fantasy kind of territory. I would also, I would also think there's, there's a scenario called the kill a Mandarin, which was the basis for uh, Richard Matheson's story, the box. Because if you, you can get a million dollars if you press oh, yeah. it right. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting one. Yeah, that's that would be, actually you know, I, I know the box story quite well. Yeah, great story. Uh, it yeah, goes that, back to Balzac if you're worried about copyright. Yeah, no, you think that would be again that, that would be an interesting one because obviously you know a, a box with a button on it is not really going to kill someone probably, but you uh, but as in that story you know there's no physical evidence of, of it working or not working. So that uh, would disclaimer, be, then you're covered, you know, if somebody dies. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's actually a good one. That's when we could probably get away with that. That would definitely be on the scary side because it would freak people out. But it wouldn't freak them out in the way that, like, a letter from a serial killer would freak them out. And this is a or sorry. They say to protect you in copyright, you can quote uh, Balzac's to kill a Mandarin scenario. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, we'd have to, well, well, I mean, I think we could probably take inspiration from it to not necessarily do literally a button, but some some me you know, mechanism like that, the idea that it would be something that you could, you know, that, that supposedly you do this, whether it's a button or a, I don't know, a, a, an envelope or a whatever that's going to have some supernatural effect if you activate it. So your, um, your, your thought is that you keep the horror supernatural. Um, or science fiction or something, right. um, just because it does... Again, it is it, it is still, I think, alarming to people when they get these things unexpectedly, and you don't want to cross over into that territory of, you know, getting stalked or otherwise threatened. Um, again, like say a bomb threat would be pretty scary, but you oh boy, not not a good idea. Yeah. Um, well, before we let you go, um, I've got one more thing, and then let's see if anyone else has any questions. But I I, I I'm just probably absolutely sure that this has been su suggested to you before but it strikes me that the dracula story would fit in nicely you know van helsing and disciples chasing uh, dracula it has in fact been considered quite strongly by us for the same reasons that call of cthulhu was interesting because it is sort of a found document it's a bunch of journals and newspaper articles right. that are sort of Put together so we have actually been thinking strongly about whether we could do that same idea basically literalizing or physicalizing dracula so you get you know a, a package or series of packages that includes you know jonathan harker's journal and you know various other people's journals and newspaper clippings about the uh uh the uh the, sh the demeter i think the ship yeah. and, um, along with other kinds of things one of the problems we had was that Unlike Cthulhu, which has, you know, the big obvious central thing, uh, mm -hmm. Dracula is less obvious. Like what would be what would be your big sort of showpiece item for a Dracula story? It's kind of yeah. like, I mean, things like a steak, it's kind of like it's a piece of wood, you know, um, 
it's, it's less obvious what kind of cool central object you could have. And, and we find that <clears throat> having something really, you know, solid and chunky and tactile is sort of key. People want that sort of thing, not just, not just books necessarily. Um, you can yeah, always so add to the legend a little bit and come up with something, I suppose. Yeah, um, we're playing with ideas like a vampire skull or something like that, you know, with yeah. fangs or... Uh, stake through the heart. Yeah, again, the issue is, like this, again, also with weapons, again, a stake is arguable, yeah. but things like the Bowie knife from Dracula would be cool. Oh, yeah. I guess a vampire um, skull would be... Um, good for the story itself because you've sort of got Van Helsing showing the player, Hey, this is what <laughs> the vampire looks like, you know, plus. Uh, yeah. You, know, you could, uh, yeah. That, that, that's called, that one's a possibility. We thought of that one. Yeah. Things, things like the Bowie knife, you know, would be neat except for the obvious challenges. Again, you can't really send yeah. knives in the mail without a lot, without a lot of trouble. Uh, things like Holy water would be the same thing, you know, water. So yeah, I mean, but definitely the idea of doing Dracula as a package is something that has occurred to us, and yeah, I'm, I'm hoping we can figure out a way to to do it sometime because it would actually be again quite interesting to see that story played out in the form of the documents that was you know that were actually. Although there's a few things we looked into, like Jonathan Harker's journal supposedly was in shorthand, which is uh, which is I think why supposedly like Dracula couldn't read it. Um, but again, that's one of those things right, that makes sense, but not that many people can read shorthand. So if you sent that out to people, it would be a pain in the ass because you'd have this sort of thing which practically nobody could read. Right. But yeah, Well, uh, right. my mom loves vampires, so right now she's probably shouting at the TV, you know, do a vampire one, do a vampire one. <laughs> no, no, vampire, yeah, no, I agree. It's one of those, it, it, it is kind of one of those things where it's a, it's a, it's a popular trope and we find that that helps because people... You know, there's and no copyright problems. problems. Uh, yeah, depending on which, yeah, which, yeah, there's probably yeah, Dracula is for sure out of copyright. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, we love those. The, although surprisingly, there's some stuff like Sherlock Holmes, which is kind of sort of out of copyright, but kind of sort of in copyright in certain ways. Yes. Yeah. You have to, you have to be a little bit cautious, even with these sort of older properties, um, depending on what the heck's going on with them commercially now. Jason, is there anything I didn't think to ask or we didn't think to ask that you'd like to um, t touch on before we let you go? Um, gosh, no, I think it was pretty pretty wide ranging. I think, yeah, I mean, certainly I think, uh, I don't know, I mean, obviously I think a lot of Lovecraft fans would, would at least be interested in checking out the Mysterious Package Company. We're definitely in the same ballpark. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, we, we're, we're continuing to do new things all the time, and uh, we certainly have a few more new Lovecraftian ideas that are percolating around that I can't quite talk about yet, but <laughs> you might be seeing them in a, uh, within, I'd say, a couple of weeks. There might be some surprises. Oh, that sounds great. So everybody go to their website and click the click on the newsletter, click on the join button. No, you'll, you'll stay in the loop. And again, the creative Cthulhu is at mysteriouspackage.com slash Cthulhu. So, um, so yeah. Hey, Jason, thanks for coming on the show and talking about this. Well, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. So, all right. What, I, uh, you know what, what other inspiration, I was going to ask you this and I forgot what inspiration, other inspiration besides like the game did you have? Well, I mean, when did a light bulb go over your head and you went, uh, I'm going to do this. Uh, well, actually, or was yeah, it gradual? Uh, the, the place I, I first became aware of it was in, um, uh, voice actor Mark Muir, that he did like Commander Shepard and some other stuff. He had as a, he collected lots of weird stuff, and I just was over at his house one day, and he had this strange looking, I think it was a Necronomicon type thing on his shelf, and uh, I said, "Where'd that come from?" And he said, "Oh, that's from the Mysterious Package Company," and in fact, uh, that was like the the original three guys who started it were just doing like these one offs out of their apartment, just you know totally bespoke things. They did maybe a dozen of them a year. Um, I just thought it was such a cool idea that it's, I sort of tracked them down and, you know, got involved with them and became essentially their investor and, you know, got the offices set up and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, just the idea of just getting something, something really weird and freaky in the mail, honestly, is, is such a cool idea that, yeah. you know, I think everyone kind of, everyone kind of likes that idea. Uh, it's just a matter of trying to find the best way to, to make it actually happen. And that's yeah. been the challenge for the last seven years, basically. It's nuts. It it's a game. Uh, me and some of my buddies used to play. One of our programmer friends made an algorithm to randomly select products off Amazon, and oh, yeah, you give it. 
uh, what's it called? Bobcat in a Box. Yeah, yeah, similar. Um, this guy named Darius Kazimi. He makes like uh, Twitter bots now. He does a bunch of stuff, but um, I know him a little bit. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it just you'd like just throw ten bucks at the bot, and it would send someone like the weird. I got like a Mormon, um, like dating guide. I mean, it's just like the nuttiest stuff. Um, yeah, that is an inspiration too. I like. I mean, that's again that idea of it, it's. You know, I, ideally, we have right now the ability to surprise other people. But what I'd really like to work on more is that ability to surprise yourself. That's mm. been that challenge. The thing, like once you you know about the mysterious package company, how do you still buy a thing that will surprise you? And so that's that's a challenge. That's a big one. That's the idea of like how do you how do you you know intentionally say you know okay I'm gonna I'm gonna give you some money now now surprise me. You know that's sort of an interesting kind of task to take on, but. Yeah. We have some. I have some ideas. We have some ideas for that, uh, but it is is it's a tricky one. Well, thank you, Jason. Appreciate you coming on the show. Well, thank you. Yeah, and I will. Uh, yeah, I will uh, check it out later. And uh, thank you for having me on. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Yeah, thanks. So uh, I think I've got a better example for for you, Jason. A uh, few years ago, all right. Not Jason. Um, Kirk. Sorry, we were just talking to Jason. Um, a few years ago, my wife and I were in like a Hallmark. And you know those cards that you can record greetings on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we went through all of them. And we would record things like like one, we'd do a scary voice like, look behind you. And, uh, you know, another one would be like, <laughs> another one would be like, you need to lose weight. And, you know, so, so <laughs> I love that it immediately goes for the like dark like <laughs> balance your checkbook now. <laughs> oh, or my God, don't you ever comb your hair? <laughs> I can't believe it's pretty funny. You he should really have a salad. I what? can't believe that Jason Kapalka. That's the bejeweled guy. Do y'all know? Oh wow, that was such a strange small universe moment. That's so neat that he's doing this awesome Michael Douglas thing now. Yeah. Well, what what did you say, Pete? I said you should really have a salad. A what, salad? What is, Why? Oh, oh, yeah, oh, 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 yeah, yeah. They the cards, yeah. <laughs> what is Bejeweled? He Kapalka was a part of a company. Um, this was like you know 15, 20 years ago that created Bejeweled along with a really famous game called Plants vs. Zombies that were mega hits. And he had a company called, it was involved with a company called PopCap. I don't want to speak for him or the involvement too excessively, but it just was, it's a really big deal. I mean, it's like meeting like a famous director or writer of it's like, holy crap, you made like one of the biggest games ever or were involved with it. And it's not it's not like talking to someone who made um Mass Effect or Doom, but in a weird way, I, I suspect more people have played Bejeweled than gosh, you know, a lot of mainstream games. Anyway, that was nuts. No, that's awesome. I love what he's doing now. So uh do I, do I have this right? Game of Thrones last episode is tonight. It's all right. Or do you guys watch Game of Thrones? No, I'm totally totally up to speed. Can we? Are we spoiler? Or no, we no, 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 no spoilers. Especially since I haven't watched any of it. I think I watched yeah. an episode once. I haven't watched it, but it is the last episode. My kids watch it. Do you it's watch it? Do you, no, I watched the first season. Yeah, I haven't watched it since. I, we don't. I, you know, obviously. I won't go into into it. I don't want to spoil anything. I will say that like many like movies that are interesting, bad or books that are interesting, bad, the last seasons have been this kind of fascinating teaching moment of like, they've got their story beats that they're hitting, but there's not, it's like, you're like, it's interesting to watch people be like, what, I don't understand what's missing. And then there's all this great writing discussion about plus, what they do plus nudity apparently God, you know it, yeah uh, is it because they went beyond the books 
and they didn't have the original inspiration from Martin. It's possible, but I think it's also possible. The other issue is that basically everybody has jobs they have to get to. Yeah, I think it's just reality of like they've been filming for eight years and the show should like in reality be like 12 seasons or 10 seasons, but like that's just not feasible um, for anyone. And so they made some tough calls about the realities of filming and big budget production. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm very happy because there's a good chance I might not have to hear about Game of Thrones every day for a while from people. <laughs> it's, well, and, but the other thing to consider is that, like, you had Supernatural ran for eight, what, 14 seasons? It's going to end after the 15th. Yeah. So you can, if you have quality production and quality actors and committed staff, you can run a show for 15 years. Yeah, the, the stories are still great. In fact, like I said last um, week, the season finale, season 14 finale, aside from the season five finale, it's it was the best finale ever. What's the budget on those things, though? I wouldn't know. I mean, so, I mean, part of, like, Game of Thrones' issue was that they were popping, like, five million an episode of... Yeah, that's like a Friends episode. <laughs> Didn't the, didn't the friends people make the, the, didn't the friends people make a hundred a uh, million dollars an episode towards the end there? Yeah, because yeah. they knew they were going to syndicate this show forever, right? And make all kinds of money on it. You don't, you know, Game of Thrones is going to be farmed out to everybody who wants it. Yeah. Okay, I guess we got our new Batman, right? You guys hear about this? Yes. Okay. I don't want a new Batman. Who who is he? I didn't Robert Robert Pattinson. Apparently, is this the vampire kid from yep. Twilight? Yep. yep. All right. He's a bat boy. I will say this. <laughs> let me let me just read a tweet um, that I'm I don't disagree with. Uh, the tweet says it's the same people rolling their eyes when they heard that Robin, Robert Pattinson was cast as the new Batman are probably the same people who rolled their eyes when Heath Ledger was cast as the Joker. Or Michael Keaton was, was originally cast as Batman. Yeah, well, there was all kinds of uproar about that, remember? Yep. Michael Keaton? Yep. But and whether you like Zack Snyder or not, and any choices he made or not, I personally do, but I, if you don't, that's fine. But... Ben Affleck made it made a damn good Batman. Yeah. I just there's such Disney has such a catalog of characters that they could do they could do something with. But they keep coming back to Batman and Superman. You mean Warner. Yeah. Warner. What did I say? Disney. Disney. Oh, Disney. I'm sorry. I meant DC. But yeah, DC, DC, yeah. DC and, and Warner, they had such a catalog of characters that they could work with. Um, but I, how many times are we going to see the origin story for Batman? Uh, well, I'll tell, you or, what the pro I'll tell you what the problem is. Marvel reached a point where if they put out anything right now that's part of the Marvel Universe, you're going to get a great number of people to see it. Kazam, which is a terrific film. Right. Uh, not counting... It's expenses, but it made less money. It brought in less money than Justice League. Yeah. So we don't know whether they'll make another Kazam movie. But, you know, if, if Marvel had made Kazam, it would be uh, one of the best Marvel movies ever made. I mean, I'd love to see the question on the big screen. And there's a movie you could make cheap. Yeah. Yeah, but it's just, are you going to get the audience? You know, well, well, Marvel's proven you can do it, but you you know right. going to a Marvel movie, you're going to get a, 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 a good product. You, you know, I've complained about it in the past, but when I look at what DC has done in recent years, Suicide Squad was a damn fun movie. It was a hell of a lot more fun than Justice League. I agree with you on that. 
So, and those are a whole bunch of unknown characters mostly. So you don't have to risk, and, and you can make it an R rated or a hard PG. Well, it, the thing that it, it had Will Smith. Yep. And uh, what, who's the name? What's the name of the actress who played uh, Harley Quinn? Yeah, I know who you're talking about. I can't. She was up. In, she's up and coming. I mean, right. Mar Mar Margaret. Major. Margaret. Margot. Margot Robbie. Right. Right. And she, she's you know, she was a rising star, and she's yeah. risen a lot because of that and other movies. Right. If, if you cast somebody big, but if you you do like uh, Shazam, which has a television star in it. Right. Even though it's an excellent movie, it doesn't make a lot of money. You know, I I, I kind of remember back to reading when I was reading the, the, the there was notes for Kingdom Come, and one of the things that they said that they realized is that every book that you put Batman or Superman in become books about Batman and Superman. It doesn't matter who who that you thought the main character was going to be. It will always be Batman or Superman as soon as they enter the fray, and you know. So maybe those characters aren't the ones that you want to keep using. Well, they 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 bring money in. Yeah, sort of. Yeah. Well, Aquaman was you know an exception to that in that he was historically a joke character. If you watched uh, a lot of. What was that? What's that? Um, Super Friends. Big, big, big Bang Theory was knocking him. Yeah, and like, you know he was kind of ridiculous in Super Friends, but yeah. And and his movie made a lot of money. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole joke line in Entourage where the main character is yeah. cast in Aquaman. Right, the, but he does for whatever reason Aquaman. I mean, maybe it's because of uh, Jason Momoa. Uh, Aquaman just caught on where Shazam did it. And, you know, it might also have been you get know, a more spectacular special effects movie. Yeah, well, you know, my kids love Shazam. Yeah, I love it too. Yeah, no, but they love the movie, and you know, I, it might be some something that we can show. You know, the, the kids can be see rather than the Batman films, which are a little violent. Or may you know it may depend. Maybe Shazam will do much better in DVD because I mean it's got great. Uh, well, I think all of us who have seen it here loved it. Yeah. I was gonna say I think Shazam's also just uh, gonna be a slow burn, man. Like maybe like in the next movie after it's had some like distribution, people will be more acclimated. But I know who Shazam and Captain Marvel is, but he's not into like main rotation. You're talking about a company that. Is constantly second guessing its directors and changing direction and, and, and rebooting its universe. What's but that? It's, it's constantly rebooting itself. Yeah, but and, it's, not just them. The comic book. Yeah. Industry. I, I, I was saying Marvel proved his Guardians of the Galaxy that you didn't have to have something well known, and that may have just been that it was an outer space epic. Right. When I saw it, I said, "This is the new, this next Star Wars." Well, yeah. Uh, something else about this Batman choice, and then I'll move on. Um, I really wish they'd have the courage to have, say, an African American Batman or a Native American Batman, uh, or an African American Green Lantern, at least, since there is one. They, they did that, yeah. Um, yeah, in the comics. Um, really, what's going to change? Yes, obviously his cultural heritage, but this is still a guy who was going to be—he was born rich. Um, you know, I notice in this trailer uh, for Batwoman that the African American computer nerd knows who Batman is, and he's telling. Uh, Kate not to go down the elevator into the Batcave um, because you're not supposed to let anybody out down there. And then in Arrow, you've got a, what? You've got an African-American tech yeah. nerd. And Wait, do you guys realize you're repeating yourselves here? Yeah, well, no, they've done it in all the shows. And it, you know? Flash, Arrow. Yeah. yeah. 
the sidekick is always African American. Yeah, or uh, um, yeah, but they well, some Flash, kind of minority. Yeah. Well, Kid Kid Flash was a different African American, uh, and uh, so was uh, his sister, whose name escapes me at the moment. Iris. Yeah, Iris. He didn't. He didn't have the nerdy guy in the computer. The nerdy, nerdy guy in the computer was Hispanic. Right, but no, but a, his dad was real. You know, his backup. Right, but I mean, but he, he, I mean, some you should have African American character. If you had, just because you have an African American character is not the issue. It's just, it's if they're the same character. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and the, you got the pretty much identical character here. And I think they're supposed to be in different universes, aren't they? Uh, from uh, yeah. same character in Arrow and the same character in um, in the new upcoming Batwoman series. Well, this is like the the Miles Morales issue of um, you know. I thought that Marvel made a smart choice by that. Rather than making Peter Parker black, they just created a new character who, in the comic, he kind of he kind of has like, he's a little bit of a boy scout, but um, the animated film, if you haven't seen that yet, they did a great job with making him like a very unique, uh, he's very much a kid from Brooklyn. If you watch that cartoon. Uh, yeah. It's a brilliant cartoon. Yeah. It deserved, it deserved the Oscar. Yeah, it so you, you almost kind of, you know, I totally hear you on the, like making, having a, um, a African-American superhero, but I, I, I liked how Marvel did it of like, why not instead of like replacing this legacy person, just create something that works within the universe. But the, uh, Batman doesn't really have a multiverse thing going, does it? Yeah, well, what's the difference? I mean, obviously there's cultural differences, but yeah, yeah. what does it matter if Bruce Wayne has black skin or white skin, really, when you come right down to it? Oh, well, it, nothing, nothing at all, but it just in it's terms just, of- It's just more to explore. You know? it, makes, it makes the character maybe somebody in his own right that just keep catching in. It's just like, you know, they temporarily, they had an Iron Man, you know, War Machine was originally Iron Man for a while. Iron Man was that supposedly been dead in the comics and so forth. So when War, you know, when you had an African-American being Iron Man, it was a different person in, in the costume. It wasn't Tony Stark. Right. Do you, um, Mike, do you think that this, uh, this person in, in the uh, Batwoman series is Lucius Fox's son. I don't know. Could be. I mean, no, he's he become uh, the hero Batwing. Yeah, that's true. But um, he's because still that, a sidekick at the moment. Right. No, but that is that's the pattern you sort of see that you know the sidekick becomes more than the sidekick. Well, here's and something he's, else he's, about Batman and Supergirl. Um, the CW seems to be taking the opposite tack than Warner Brothers does. They seem to really hate Batman and Superman with a passion. I mean, in Supergirl, you got you got Superman recently, who's been Superman for years and years. Tell Supergirl that she's stronger than him. And he's leaving Earth because Earth doesn't need him as long as it has her. Um, okay. You know, despite the fact that Superman's got more experience. Um, and, you know, the same thing with, with Batwoman. She's, she's what? She's following in Batman's footprints. I think it would have been better for both of these characters. I mean, we're talking about a multiverse, right? There's no problem with both of these characters where Supergirl, in, in the Supergirl world, there was no Superman ever. And in the Batman, Batwoman world, there was no Batman ever. Why do we have to have these two women following in the footsteps of an older male? We don't. We can just eliminate them. And then they go, oh, shit. You know, we got to explain the fact that Batman and Superman aren't here. And if Superman is here... Um, you know, we got to make some reason up for him to leave. So, I mean, Pete, you're heavily into DC like I am, and, and Rick, you're 
somewhat too. I mean, you see any problem with that? I mean, why couldn't well, it just be a Batwoman well, only? Yeah, uh, Sony did it well. When they they had Venom without Spider Man. I never th would have thought that was possible, but they made it work. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, there was a, at one point a long time ago something called the League of Batman. Yeah, I remember they, that. You're yeah. not talking about Batman Incorporated, are you? No, there was foreign Batman. They were foreign. They were okay. people who were inspired by Batman, but they were in like Tokyo and you know, and I think Batwoman was one of them, but there was another version of Batwoman who came from another dimension, another reality where she rode a giant dog with bat wings, if I'm remembering correctly. But well, yeah. yeah, I mean, we've all done that, yeah. Yeah, but you know, so so there's you know there were there's lots of opportunity here to do something different, right? You know, and it's a multiverse, you can do whatever right. you want. But it would have been cool, you know. You're right. It would have been cool to have her come in and and come in and say, oh, you know, you could do it as a standalone, or you could have her come over and say, oh, this is very interesting. This guy's copying me. Yeah. And you know, she feels that she's the original. Yeah, which is you know, uh, it's funny because everybody talks about. I'm gonna switch universes here. The Black Widow, but the Black Widow I always loved was the one that came out in the 30s and 40s. Where for the devil? Yeah, she worked for the devil, and she killed criminals. Um, I that's you know, it, there's lots of ways to do these things, and there there there's better ways to do it. Well, if they ever if they ever use that version, it will have a different name than Black Widow. Yes. <coughs> okay. Um, moving on, and well, absolutely no spoilers, but I finally got to see Avengers Endgame. I, I think it's With I, Logan. I think it's a month. I think you can you can we can do spoilers now. Okay. Well, no, uh, let's put it this way: if you have not seen Avengers Endgame. Uh, we're not going to talk about too much more, just a couple of other things. So you might want to bow out now. So you've been warned. Five, four, three, two, one. That fucking battle scene was awesome at the end. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great conclusion. You could nitpick, or it's really not nitpicking. There were a whole lot of scenarios about people coming back after five years. And what the world would be like. <laughs> oh yeah, it would be awful. <laughs> but, yeah, but, but I know what I, just, I I know, I know, but just enjoy the movie and forget about it. Right. Hey, Rick, have you ever seen um, a movie called Move Over Darling? No. Uh it actually stars Doris Day. And it's about a woman whose husband disappears. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, I yeah. saw her. James Gardner. Yeah, and she so she gets married, and on the day of her marriage, he shows back up again. Yeah. So now, in the judge is like, "What do you want me to do?" So it was the opposite situation. She disappeared, and then her husband remarried on it. Yeah, the, well, the movie's been made like four or five times. Yeah. So my but, question is, okay, Peter Parker dis disappeared for five, five years. years. Is, he, is he now in the same grade of as kids who were five years younger than him? So the yes, the, the running explanation is that, that his entire class disappeared. Or at least all the all, all the important kids that were in the uh, <laughs> right, in, in the previous Spider-Man movie. It may be interesting if the Vulture's daughter is now five years older. Yeah, it was Vulture was so cool. My but, favorite yeah. parts. I did love the world building where they had the like moments of talking about like one how cataclysmic it would be if half the world's population vanished in terms of like. Food supply, shipping, all the things we do, like rubber. Um, right. But then I love, um, Rick, your point about, like, if all those people suddenly returned, it's like, I'm going to guess most of the arable land's gone to crap. The yeah. Most of the people have, like, migrated to, like, major metro areas. Like, it's well, not. Think about Detroit and do Detroit everywhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. The 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 gritty witch that would go downhill so bad. Right. I I can see a guy reappearing in his apartment after five years, and there's two people looking at him like he's weird, saying, "Get out of my house!" And he's like, 
uh, what? What? This yeah. is my apartment. Well, the thing I think about... What do you mean I lost my lease? You're also going to have a huge unemployment problem because you've been replaced at your job if it still exists. Right. Yeah. And then you're going to have to resolve uh, real estate and wills and marriages. Yeah, I, I, I have to say I wasn't a fan. I loved the movie, but I was not a fan of them coming back five years later. They should have just made it so they never left. I, I think yeah. that there's, a, there's some really good storytelling that could be done because the snap kill you know makes 50% of the population disappear. Right. Let's say that 10% more die as a fallout of that. Right. Immediately. You know, yeah, everybody on the plane without the yeah. pilot dies. Right, you don't, you don't bring back the ten percent who weren't snapped. Right, you don't. But then, over the course of the next five years, because your support and infrastructure is spread out too far, you're going to lose more people. Um, so maybe another ten percent. So now you've lost seventy percent, maybe sixty-five. And, and just to be fair here, we're coming. This has been discussed all <laughs> over the internet. Right. Well, no, I, I I was thinking about this for a while. I no, no, but I'm just saying we're late to the discussion. Was, uh, oh, yes, yeah. but, but 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 we four are right. Yeah. That's the yeah. no, 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 yeah. no, no. But we all saw it. I think anybody rational saw it. But I'm just going to say, yeah. right. If, if you want to get, get have a great discussion, if you want to see something that's been done prior, what culture that com did an excellent video on this. Right, ten problems after Endgame. Top ten well, problems. So, so my 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 the story I would love to tell is the the reunion story, where all these people are showing up and greeting their loved ones who've been gone, and there's the one woman who's just sitting there left alone because her husband didn't die in the snap; he died in the aftermath. Right. Yeah. Or and what about the the wife that comes back, and, and her, her husband husband's dead. remarried, or her or her husband died and committed suicide? Right. Yeah, they they should have finagled the story so they came back right the the second they left, like it didn't happen. Yeah, I I wonder if it it's going to create a kind of plot black hole that's going to keep like. But wait, why? They're, no, they're just going to hand wave it, Kurt. Yeah, yeah. Like, whatever. That's what they're going to do. They may but have it, they may you may have a villain out there who like you know like Zemo had a legitimate beef in Civil War. Right. Yeah. Well, something take, first you didn't prevent the snap, then you, when you brought it back, you screwed it up more. I'm about to kill all the Avengers. If I were to guess who the big bad of the next arc is, you the same game as, as I do, say it. Ramatut? Yes. Yeah. Or Kang as he is now. Kang, yeah, Kang. Oh wow. Uh, yeah, I, I keep seeing like rumor threads about it, but I guess I'm showing my age. I keep rooting for Secret War, but you're, uh, you're I, showing your age. Okay. Yeah, they go, they're, going in, they're going into all the time streams and time mess ups, and that's going to screw up people in the future a lot. Right. Yeah. Okay. Can I talk about a couple of my favorite parts of this movie? No, but guess yes. Okay. yes. Well, you know. It, it is my show, kind of. <laughs> really, I'll be right back. It's, like, it's really talking. Pete's show, but I'm the figurehead. Um, <laughs> moment number one, when Captain America picks up Thor's hammer. Yep. That yeah. was great. And Thor yells, I knew it, or something to that effect. He did. That, what he man, I wanted to stand up and cheer. That <laughs> was great. Um... Moment number two, when Stephen Strange goes like this, just real subtly to Iron Man, points his finger upward. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, those are my top two. I, I think the other, only other thing I would say is that when, when Cap was done fighting Thanos, or at least getting tired, and I forget who said on your left and all these people start coming out of portals. That was pretty awesome. Yeah, the, the Falcon. Yeah. And then another moment would be uh, <laughs> during the battle when all of a sudden the, what is it, Thanagarian spaceships? Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the evil spaceships? 
Yeah, no, I'm can. thinking of DC. It, well, yeah, well, it, the evil space. Levi- Leviathans are the ones that look like whales. Right. So they they start shooting up into the sky, and somebody says, "What the hell are they shooting at?" And Captain Marvel's just like, "Boom!" Right through that, <laughs> right through that craft, like it's not even there. <laughs> now, you want to hear a wild theory that I have? Sure. There's a debate. The directors say one thing and the writers say another of how Captain America changed the timeline. Some say it's an alternate timeline where he's with, the director said he's an alternate timeline with Peggy Carter. And the writer said it's the same timeline that this was always meant to be and that he has been posing as that husband she mentioned in uh, Winter Soldier. And you just encapsulized the two main arguments in time travel you know? right yes but but here's he goes back in time the first place he's going is new york because he got two infinity stones there right he's going to see the ancient one who's an expert on time travel that's going to affect how he lives a lot so a spell could be cast to make him part of the timeline for him to survive in the past you'd have to have a heaven can wait scenario where he looks different to everybody but peggy and he would have to have a new identity. So what would that new identity be? I think he's Peter Quill's grandfather. Because the makeup <laughs> makeup makes him look like Greg Henry, the actor who plays Peter Quill's grandfather. Okay. I like it. And yeah, no, that's tight. I mean, that was my one... I'm probably going to get corrected on this, but I thought the movie did yeah, the wrong. whole thing of saying... No, no, we're alternate timelines where it's like in Dragon Ball Z, where if you travel back in time, it creates a branch. And then at the very end, Steve Rogers goes back in time and lives all the way to the present. And I was like, I thought they just said this isn't what it, it is. And just to bring back, we've seen the time stone used twice in two movies, Infinity War and Doctor Strange. Yeah. Even though Mordo mentioned something about, you know, alternate realities and whatever, we saw no evidence that Strange did anything to damage anything. So I think if you use the Time Stone and know how to use it, you don't have those uh, alternate reality problems. Right. Yeah, I prefer to think of it as anything that happens is part of one reality. And if you were, if you affected events 50 years before you were born, say, that's just part of reality. That's just part well, of the time stream. The other thing is if you're using the time stone and the reality stone at the same time. That's true. Because he would have, he would have he could give back to the ancient one. So uh, I just liked I like the scene with the Hulk where he was like, Look, if you're not gonna accept this and why are you accepting any of it? Like none of this goes anywhere. <laughs> It's like in Hawkeye on uh, in Age of Ultron where he's like, I have a bow and arrow. None of this makes sense. Just just roll with it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I didn't know one thing that uh until I read to the writers, uh, the Hulk's arm is permanently injured. Oh no. Oh, really? Yeah, because well, he says, you know, Thanos they say that his now, maybe they'll have him do something with gamma rays to make it better or whatever, but it's it's not going to cure on its own. Dude, there's so much unexplored Hulk material. I mean, it's time. Mark Ruffalo's ready. I'm ready. Like, Red yeah. Hulk. Uh, I mean, they touched off on, like, Planet Hulk, but not really. First time I saw the Mark Ruffalo Hulk in Endgame, I went myself, oh, my God, they actually went there. Yeah. Yeah. But it's um, been done tons of times in the comics. Well, right. yeah, but I didn't think they'd ever do it in a movie. So the uh, so two things I want to talk about bef- that you mentioned, Mike. Um, the on your left thing. Yeah. I think that's from Winter Soldier, where he they were running. Yeah. When yeah, they- yeah, 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 okay. yeah. Oh man, good point. Right. Yeah. So he's just, it's it's a flashback to that film. Yeah, that's a great point. That, that that's been pointed out by a lot of people. Right. It's, it's the same. We're not taking credit as being the only brilliant people. Right. Just the um, brilliant, but yeah, go on. The other thing I would like to point out is that the 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 two things that go together, the Steve Rogers lifting Thor's hammer and now Thor joining the Guardians of the Galaxies could open up a new character that I'd love to see. 
And that he's is been confirmed. Beta yeah. Ray Bill. He there is at least I've seen some websites claiming he's been he can is confirmed for Guardians Three. I yeah. that may turn out to be a false rule, but because we have heard a lot of things about people. Who've been, who've been I would confirmed. love to see Beta Ray Bill. The only guy I know who's going to be in Phase Four because Kevin Feige said it went this week or last week is the Mandarin, the real Mandarin. Right. He's coming so the, out. Other, the other thing that I like is that, you know, in Ant-Man and the Wasp, Cassie, who's really, really small child, it talks about wanting to be his partner. But we'll let, her, let Janet do that instead. Now she's five years older and that opens up the possibility for her to become stature. What what is she thirteen now? I think she's thirteen. I think she's a little older than that. She can't be more than fourteen. Maybe. I mean, I'm just thinking of when she was a girl. Yeah. But anyway, it, you know, it puts that it puts the, the the new actress having the possibility of of gaining those powers and interacting with. Ant, the Ant Man and the Wasp in a in a more uh, reasonable way. Well, it's also you're setting up Young Avengers. Yeah, what, the ultimate game plan. We also have the possibility of the kid from Iron Man Three coming back as somebody. I and I think I know who that is. But yes, one other thing that I really liked was and and <coughs> you know it wasn't the first movie, but it was the first. Adventure chronologically, obviously, uh, Captain America, the first adventure, uh, the first Avenger. Um, so the franchise starts off with him really chronologically. And then at the end to have him sitting on that bench as an old man. I mean, I assume his whole life, he knew exactly what moment, you know, he's going to walk down the path and sit on the bench. Because he didn't appear on the bench, right? I think he's yeah. yeah. He just sat, went, walked down and sat on it. And it also, it also looks like he discussed this with Bucky. Because if, yeah. if you re see, I've only seen the movie once, but all the clips are on YouTube. If you don't right. find them, I'm gonna miss you. Yeah, I'm gonna miss. I mean, he, Bucky knew what was going on. Yeah. Well, yeah. I guess my point is that it all started with Captain America, and the very last shot in Endgame is Captain America with the woman that he loves, the woman that he's always wanted to be with, and he gets to spend the rest of his life with her. So it was it was a great way to end that movie. Well, I mean, she passes in Winter Soldier, and then he's still alive for Endgame. Sorry, I, with me being Debbie Downer, <laughs> sorry. Well, well he, li he lives most of his life with her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, he may, he may well, we could all hope for, right? He, yeah. he, he may he could have been in, in I, as I said before, I think if, if for him to be in the same timeline, they had to be a spell cast that he looks differently to everybody, sort of like heaven can wait. Yeah. Or he could have just got he dyed his hair and grew a beard. I just yeah. have a hard time thinking that Steve Rogers would stat version would stay out of things. Okay, I get the answer for that. Ancient one also puts a spell on him. You won't remember anything that happened in the future until you reach a certain point. Well, it's like Tilda Swinton is just sort of like Steve. Have I got a deal for you? Yeah, yeah. But it's, that's the old you know Legion of Superheroes, Superboy. Uh, comic book ploy. Or it could yeah. be just as simple as he has this enhanced strength and reflexes and he doesn't he, he doesn't worry about world shattering events because he knows there aren't any. He basically tries to keep the crime rate down where he lives. Yeah, well, well, yeah. That, that'd be fine. I, I want to see going to allow Hydra to, to grow and take over S.H.I.E.L.D. Yeah. I can't. I can't see him letting that happen. I can't. I can't see him letting Nixon happen. But if um, he had no memory. But if he, yeah, it only works if he has. Remember when the Superboy used to go into the future, Legion of Superheroes, come back to his time, and boy, how did we defeat? Uh, or by the way, who who was that guy who came up with that brilliant plan? It was the mind of a computer. I can't remember his name. All right. 
Well, it's, it's kind of like, because he's going, he's not going back to the 40s. He's going back to um, the. It'll be around 1950, I think, based yeah. on where Agent Carter. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like that Stephen King book about um, trying to stop the JFK assassination. Have you ever, have you ever read that one? Yeah, yeah, I've read it. It's a brilliant piece of historical fiction, but I mean, he probably just gets sucked into like the nine to five, man. Um, I'm just cutting well, Steve some slack. Some, yeah. some people have compared it to uh, Final Countdown, which had a, something along those lines. Well, the guy, the guy went back to from uh, whatever that movie was made, the 80s. Yeah. To, to the 40s. Well, he, he said he wouldn't let LBJ happen. You know, he's not a god. He's just a he's just a guy that's super strong and has great reflexes. How is he going to stop LBJ from happening? No, he, no, might, he, he might have to let it happen because it would be worse to, you know, see right. like, you know yeah. the Star Trek conundrum. Yeah. You know, yeah. Let Edith, Edith Killer die. In fact, I've got a time travel novel. Not me. I read a time travel novel where they're trying to prevent um, World War One, And they do, and when they come back, things are so, so much worse than they yeah. would have been if they just left it alone. Because maybe when you maybe even the when you finally have that world war, it's even more horrible. Yeah, um, yeah. If well, it was me, if I went back in time, I would not change world events. I have to tell you because I don't know if something worse is going to happen if I do. I mean, it's one of those. It's one of those better the devil you know than the one you don't. Yeah. Also, like World War One is very specifically a series of like cultural forces colliding. How do they even stop it? Like, do they just save the Duke? Yeah. Yeah. That's what they were. I doing. mean, uh, yeah, but I mean, it's, it would, it would probably, the, the world war was coming. Yeah. That, that's my thing. Is like, I think world war two, maybe if you'd like eased up on um, the reparations and everything, you could have worked something out, but like world war one was Victorian culture reaching its inevitable implosion. And you had a lot of false starts before that, which almost caused World War Two. Yeah, they were. They World, were World, World, World War One. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, like the Moroccan crises, and there was some Balkan crises before. Franz Ferdinand got killed, and you want a, a random book plug? Um, Barbara Tuchman's um book about that Gilded Era. It's like 1890 to like 1910 or whatever, and just how insane. Like just people showing up to like countries and like shooting the natives and enslaving. It was just nuts. Proud Tower. Yep. Well, yep. If Great anyone time. is interested about the time travel book that I mentioned about <coughs> about changing world wars, um, it's called uh, Time and Time Again by Ben Elton. E L T O N. Oh yeah. And uh, I, I believe it was World War II that they were uh, trying to I'll change. Think, since we're, we so. were talking about, since this is a supernatural show that we uh, yes. are <laughs> I, I think I think I just wanted to bring up Marvel's doing a new Ghost Rider series with the the same I mean, Hulu with the same actor uh, Gabriel Luna who played him on Agents of Shield, though they claim right now it's not going to be connected to the Shield version. And they're going to do uh, Hellstorm, which was this originally the son of Satan. Yeah. Which means I, I think if they're doing Hellstorm, we're definitely going to get Mephisto in some way or form finally. Because I see oh. you can do Ghost Rider and maybe dance around Mephisto, but I can't see how you can do the guy who's the son of Mephisto without having him in it. And then does that mean we get Patsy Walker back? No, she'll still be on Jessica Jones. You'll get Santana probably. Oh. Um, speaking of Hulu, guys, um, Hulu has made a deal. I'm reading from Bloody Disgusting's website. Um, Hulu has made a deal to develop a pilot episode of The Eyes of the Dragon by Stephen King, possible series. Man, I would love that. That's See, a good book. I love I love the Eyes of the Dragon. We may have the Necronomicon if they do that. 
because that was in that little one scene of uh, original Eyes of the Dragon. Well, you know, the other thing they've got to be thinking is that Game of Thrones is over and people are going to be jonesing for something similar. Yeah. Which I I don't know how you would say that this was similar, but it's it's in the area. Uh, let's put it that way. Well, they still doing that Lord of the Rings uh, spinoff? Apparently, yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of down. I'm kind of down for the Lord of the Rings thing just because um, Sauron has such unexplored backstory. I know that sounds nuts, but have y'all ever heard of the Cimmerian? Yeah, he does. He does. Yeah. And as a villain that was even that was his mentor who was more powerful. Yeah, I mean, there's. I'm assuming it's going to be like just during his like shape shifting phase. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm like I'm down for that. I, I saw a lot of people like grumbling about it, and I was like, mm, he does a lot of cool stuff. He like he wasn't always a suit of armor. I don't think he ever was in the. Yeah, world. I, I mean, also he he's he's been a great villain as a special effect, but we don't have any personality there. Yeah. Yeah. Not that, not, not that that's a problem. I think people go, go overboard about that. <clears throat> no, he's got a pretty great personality. He's just, you know, he's not very good looking, but great personality. Well, he's yeah, he's a, a Maiar. My token yeah. lore is weak these days. He's like, a, he's one of um. He's like a oh, oh, Morgoth, I think was the guy's name. He's one of like the angels sent by sent on the realm. Like he's he's equal to Gandalf in power, right? Yeah. Uh. Well, <laughs> that's, that's the thing is, in the original Lord of the Rings trilogy, he was just a name, and we saw his eye, but we never, we never got a real feeling for him as an individual. Well, we know he doesn't blink. <laughs> he, he, was, he was a special effects villain, and this those yeah, can be effective yeah. as opposed to. You know, it's the difference between Ronan, the accuser, and Thanos. Has anybody seen the uh, Tolkien biopic? No. No, not yet. No. <laughs> I'll wait for it to come to Amazon, probably. I've got two more quick things, and I'll let you guys go. Um, I'm in the middle of a book called Slade House. Have you guys read this? By David Mitchell. Yeah. It's either a very short novel or it's a novella. I haven't. I don't know how many words it is. But it, I'm about three quarters of the way through it. It is really creepy, and I recommend it. Slade is S L A D E. Slade okay. House. Uh, and then the other thing I just wanted to say that I am really, really looking forward to watching uh, scary stories to tell in the dark this summer. It looks good. Have you guys seen the trailer for this? Yeah. Mm -mm. Yeah, it looks good. That pale lady, man, she looks creepy. So it'll be, I mean, it'll be fun to bust out my copy and um, check it out. That sounds like good viewing. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, I really appreciate you being here. Um, hope you guys have a good week. Uh, thanks to everyone who is a patron, keeps me going. Uh, we just did a good, great patron podcast with Vince LaRosa. Uh, just Google Lovecraft Easing Patreon. And um, we will see you next week. Bye, all.